Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area with guests Jennifer Friedenbach, Executive Director of the Coalition on Homelessness in San Francisco, Louis Shequin, CEO of Abode Services, and Anne Quayton, CEO of Conard House. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for participating. And thank you all guests for, for being here to discuss this really important topic. Now, you know, if you look at homelessness, it's just startling. The San Francisco Bay Area has a real uh, pandemic, if I can use that word, of homelessness uh, here, and it affects um, different groups unequally. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how you see the issue. And Jennifer, let's, let's kick it off with you um, as the executive director of the Coalition on Homelessness in San Francisco. Talk about how you see this problem here in, in the city, the Bay Area, and indeed the United States, because we're very representative, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we have a massive humanitarian crises across the United States, but it's particularly, uh, particularly hit the West Coast with our rising rents. And that's really what it's all connected to. I mean, we have um, you know, we've had two episodes of mass homelessness in the United States, of course, the Great Depression, and then we came out of that and committed uh, to housing everyone in the United States. Um, and then starting in late 1970s, and then really um, quite starkly in the early 1980s, started uh, really disinvesting from housing um, poor people in the United States. And then we saw the, the massive increase. And since then, we've made a whole series of really bad policy decisions that have only exasperated the issue. Um, and we've made a whole lot of bad decisions to just not do anything at all at the federal level. And so this issue has really been left to local municipalities for the most part to try to address, um, who have a much lower tax base. Um, and so we've really, we've really had to get creative um, to try to address it, um, but uh, have not been successful. Have not been successful at all in terms of um, being able to really uh, move the dial up and down the West Coast on homelessness because of that increasing pressures around rising rents, uh, more and more people losing their housing. Um, so uh, we've basically responded, you know, here and across the United States with the police response. Um, we're really managing um, people's presence in the, in the um, public spaces. Um, and then that ends up exasperating homelessness and wasting even more resources. So in the end, we're spending a lot more money to keep people homeless than we would if we just housed them in the first place. We're going to come back to the whole history of, of housing and homelessness in the United States, because we do have to get beyond complaining about the problem and pointing fingers and developing solutions that the that the society can absorb. But before we do that, uh, Lewis, how do you see the situation and how does Abode try to try to address this uh, this issue? Yeah, I really appreciate uh, Jim for giving context there. And, uh, you know, the other thing I would add is that uh, racial inequality is, is part of the story. California, we like to think of ourselves as uh, progressive. In many ways we are, but around housing, we've been horrible, uh, particularly as it relates to redlining out people who are poor and people of color in particular. So, uh, you know, I, I, I say that. And then I also think uh, sort of with the two hats on, the other hat is optimism because uh, my organization started, uh, as many have in this country, as a reaction to homelessness. We were providing shelter, and now we're, we're housing on any given night to over 7,000 individuals. Um, and we're doing it in buildings we operate, as well as uh, through rental assistance to, to people. And that, uh, you know, it, it has struck me more, more recently that, um, you know, those of us doing this work, if we were invested People invested in our work, we could get there. Actually, this this is solvable. Um, you know, we we need to not be Pollyannish about it. And I appreciate Jennifer's very stark description because it is true that this we're in a deep hole. But uh, we could get out of this with the right investment. Um, you know, if you look at what the the politicians just did in D.C., I mean, it, it really it, it's amazing. Overnight, we're going to cut poverty in half. Um, through legislation and through an investment. We could do the same sort of thing with homelessness, but it's gonna take that sort of investment. And Anne, you, your organization serves a subset of the total homelessness uh, population. Could you just 
talk a little bit about, because um, Lewis talked about racial disparities, but there are also disparities based in uh, mental health issues, right? And, you know, we, we so often see people who are clearly troubled. Uh, many are not troubled, many are just poor um, who are homeless, but, but there are also a subset of people who have real mental health issues and how we treat people and how we discard them can result in, in terrible conditions, but you and your organization, Canard House, are trying to address that. Absolutely, and thank you very much, Mark, and great to see you, Lewis and Jennifer. And I, and I do want to applaud both of you, and certainly Jennifer has been a leader in addressing and trying to end homelessness for, for, for decades, so my whole career, and I don't want to age us too much, so, um, so let me not say decades. But anyhow, so it is, um, and I appreciate all of us still being here and really focus on it. I um, came to Connor House actually in July. Um, because it's an organization that started in 1960, really to address the mental health crisis. So asylums had been closed, particularly the Napa, Napa Asylum. Um, and there was actually no housing. There wasn't services. There wasn't residential treatment. There wasn't anything set up to really be able to support people living in the community, which was the right thing to do. I think that is when Conard House started, um, kind of as this first halfway house, and through that time has, has grown to serve 700 residents and grown to other support services, money management services, addressing the homelessness crisis that came along, as Jennifer has said. And I would say, you know, a lot of it for me is, um, yeah, it is, we don't have the systems, we don't have the policies. I think we have uh, some of the right policies, some of the right funding, some of the right systems, and we just never go all the way um, is a lot of what I am seeing. And I also think, you know, thank you for bringing up the mental health piece. I mean, housing and healthcare are just human rights. So it just, we continue to not prioritize what we all believe are human rights. And so if we really prioritize that, which would mean most of our funding and our policies and our systems and our, and our will, we would be going there. But like I say, we, we somewhat go there. We somewhat have services. We somewhat are helping a lot of people. So I really came to Connor House to see there are solutions. I do believe we can make this happen. Um, and I wanted to make sure and get kind of really closer to it and closer to the population that people complain the most about. Um, you know, and it's just not right. You know, if you look at the history of homelessness in the United States and going back to colonial times, homelessness is not a, it is not a new problem. And then, you know, sort of fast forward to the aftermath of World War I, we had the 10 cities. Uh, in Washington of homeless vets who came back and were living in poverty, right? And then you go through the Great Depression and the massive homelessness that, that occurred there. The whole uh, post-World War II uh, experience of investing in America and creating these, these uh, small uh, enclaves like Levittown and so on and so forth was, was really a response to the World War I experience so that we did not end up with masses of of uh, homeless vets coming in and, and the GI Bill and so on. And then you keep going through the, through the history of the United States and we see homelessness, Jennifer, metastasize. Um, there seems to be a, a, an issue with American prosperity in which those who are most prosperous, when we end up with a concentration of wealth, we also have an explosion of homelessness. Right? Because the people who are creating the wealth are not just the people who receive it, but the workers who contribute to that success. We see it in Amazon, we see it in Walmart, we see people who are very, very low wage having to concentrate themselves in places that are very high cost of living, which is what you how you characterize the Bay Area, Jennifer. How do we deal with this while keeping this idea of American prosperity and innovation and entrepreneurship? How do, we, how do we create the, the, the appropriate balance so that we don't end up with East German, you know, uh, concrete living quarters um, that were also not a solution, but were very equitable, right? How, how do we end up with, with something that is American, but solves this issue? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I brought up kind of the two episodes of mass homelessness, because of course, the first time around, we you know, we were able to address it. Um, we made some mistakes, um, I think, as a country in terms of how we developed public housing and um, did it in a way that was separate from the economic engines of the particular cities that were built in or often kind of 
you know, off away from banks and schools and, you know, um, public transportation and really kind of, um, you know, isolated poverty in this way. Um, but we know, we know, you know, as Anne was saying, um, you know, we know how to walk our way out of this. We need to have the resources possible to do it. And so, um, you know, right now, interestingly enough, during the pandemic, and I know we're going to talk more about that, but we have a lot of opportunity to do that. Um, we can do, you know, I mean, if we really invest in folks and we make sure that they have that baseline of a safe and decent place to call home, um, we can do this in a myriad of different ways. It doesn't have to be one, one type of um, housing intervention. It can be, um, you know, housing subsidies that happen immediately in the private market, but we're also building um, housing and mixed income. We're also doing housing that is um, homeless housing, but has a very strong um, uh, community building and um, economic um, building um, components to it. Um, we can do, we can incorporate as we're moving our way out of homelessness, we can make sure that we're creating jobs for people who have personally experienced homelessness, folks who have um, a lived experience that's so important to bring to a job with um, with behavioral health issues, for example. I mean, all of this can be incorporated in a way to have this very beautiful vision where we're not only making sure that people have that foundation to jump off of, of a safe and decent home, but where they have the opportunity um, to really lift themselves out of poverty um, and lift themselves out of isolation and, um, you know, all this stuff that happens. And, you know, I think, you know, part of this is, you know, mo moving this and, and, and kind of building um, on um, Lewis's point um, we can also do it in a way that is really getting at um, correcting some of the inequities that um, that have been constructed. Um, we can very deliberately make sure that people who have been disproportionately negative impacted communities by homelessness that they um, that uh, that they have you know they're first in line for access. And so I think um, you know there there's definitely um, a lot of ways out of this, and a, and a big part of that is having the political will to make it happen. So you're talking about community reinvestment, right? You're talking about investing in, you can call it an economic impact zone. You can call it a village. You can call it uh, trying to build consumers, right? I mean, you could, you could call it a lot of different things. Characterization is so important in our politics. So maybe part of this is, is you know, we can call it income redistribution or we can call it investment, right, Lewis? I mean, it yeah. really is, is about how do you create a stronger community? Yeah, we do. And so it would be wise for us to watch out for the mistakes we made in the past. You know, when we did redevelopment, when we did these economic zones, they often benefit wealthy people and, and, and maybe some folks in the middle class. And they, you know, we're not intent. We didn't intentionally focus on vulnerable populations with uh, special needs. And we're paying a price for that. Um, so my organization noticed that we weren't placing anyone. We were doing shelter in the beginning. That's all we were doing. We couldn't find housing for the, the people we were serving in the shelter. Um, and they were, they were ready day one for housing. And it just wasn't available, even from the nonprofit housing developers. So we're now a, a, a housing developer. And uh, we're, we have 15 projects in the pipeline. We're building supportive housing with the community at Jennifer was, you know, amenities that Jennifer was referring to, it absolutely can be done. These are communities that succeed, that actually are in beautiful buildings. They're not in uh, East Germany. Uh, you know, the, the, it's not socialism. This is about- the It's not a ghetto. It isn't a ghetto. And it's, you know, it's the best part of America, actually, that when we have a problem in the past, we, we'd say, we got this problem, let's solve it. And America just roll their sleeves up and go and do it. The problem is we have racism and other inequalities and stigmatized. So Anne's working with a very stigmatized population. You know, thank goodness you're doing that work because folks don't want to have those people around. And let's just tell the truth. And we have to really face that down. But if we, you know, build housing that's quality everywhere, not in just some neighborhoods then we could really get ourselves out of this. So I think the answer is not the public housing we saw that was substandard in most cases to the local standard. You know, Nick, the Nixon administration actually at HUD said, you can't build public housing that is as good as the standard in a local community. It had to be substandard. You, know, you just think about that. That's a setup for disaster. 
And it was. So we're right. tearing these buildings down. But if you now build the buildings that are communities that, that, that are, quite frankly, the sort of buildings we're building that, uh, quite frankly, the best looking buildings on the block, you uh, finance them appropriately so they're, they're uh, operated uh, well and into the future, you can uh, take off the marketplace enough units where people who can't have even a dream of competing. I mean, think about it. Middle-class people in the Bay Area can't compete for housing. You know, housing is the thing that keeps them up at night. If you're poor and you have special needs, you can't even compete. It's not about competing, it's about scrapping something together. So if we could take off the marketplace competition that some housing for those folks, and it's, you know, it's a good percentage. It's probably, you know, 15, 20%. Of, of the housing in this country, we move to that, then we'll look more like a Scandinavian country where you, you still have some homelessness, but it's a matter of weeks before someone's placed into, uh, into some sort of housing opportunity. So we just completed a poll and, and mind you, it is a select audience, but about 60%, actually 58% of, of respondents said that they uh, experienced or know somebody who's experienced homelessness. Very interesting uh, result. Now I'm sure I can drive that up. Here's how. Have you ever had a relative who've had, who's had to couch surf? Or have you ever had a kid that had to come back home um, after college? Because we're doing work right now for first place for youth. These are kids that are aging out of foster care. And if my kid was in foster care, um, I'm sure that they would be in supportive housing at some point because young people need some, some help at times, right? So when you look at homelessness, if you look at housing issues and you start to, to correct for the fact that some of us have means, then all of a sudden your definitions change of, of, of what homelessness is. Because, um, you know, when I was a young person, I had to go back to my parents' house. I had a place to go. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, um, and, I, 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 and I'm sensitive to, to the fact that there are, you know, I look at it as really, it's the community. And people are, you know, even with their families, their own families, right? They're really struggling sometimes to help these folks, right? And so a lot of people that are at Conard House, um, have lost connection with their families. Um, and so I think, um, and not all, but, but a lot. And so I think this concept of, yes, there's a community here. This is a place for everybody. Um, I, I think we mentioned that, you know, other places we don't see as much homelessness. Certainly we don't because all the dollar goes to prevention. Right. All the money is going towards people who are, whether it's special needs or end up having an episode of mental health, end up having some kind of traumatic incident that results in kind of um, the situation we're in. Or frankly, there just isn't uh, the availability, affordability, public education. We can name those things. So I think we still do not have resources like we talked about for our whole community. Um, and I do think, um, you know, kind of victimizing people, stigmatizing people, um, continuing to not relate to people, um, that is not gonna ever help us. Yeah, well, should, um, we, and, should Americans discard other Americans? For of course not, but what it, I think our policies can't. So yeah, we have, we, there are people, right? This is what the situation we're in. We have to actually have policies so that that isn't really taking priority that we're not at the whim of whatever kind of political atmosphere that we're all of a sudden in and now this is what we're faced with. So this has to be something that is, it is part of the fabric of America, the policy of America, the budget of America. So it's not at the whim of that. I'd like to ask you all a question uh, which was posed in our, our Q and A section. It's a very sensitive topic, but let's, let's uh, try and deal with it um, in an economic sense. Um, there are places where there are high costs and places where there are low costs. Uh, we were asked, uh, why not move people who have needs to where those needs can be fulfilled the lowest possible costs? Yeah, why, not, why not move people to, to, to where um, uh, it would be cost effective to house them? Jennifer, you were, you were yeah. about to say. Yeah, I mean, we, we are doing that. I mean, we've been sending black and brown people out of San Francisco um, majorly. Um, we have, you know, our African-American population has dropped down significantly. 
Um, this recent, you know, pre-pandemic, um, several years of gentrification saw um, the wholesale displacement of an entire Latino uh, community in the mission. Um, we are sending people out of town all the time. We in San Francisco, if you're a homeless family, pretty much your only option right now is a short-term housing subsidy um, that is uh, really most likely going to send you um, out of town. What does that mean? Um, that you and you use that subsidy. That means that you, because the overwhelming majority of unhoused people became unhoused in the city that um, they last lived um, and paid rent. Um, that means that for San Franciscans, um, and you lose connections with your family members because you're impoverished and you can't afford transportation to see them. You don't have somebody to watch your kids when you go to the grocery store. Um, you, um, the, the most likely you're gonna suffer isolation. You're gonna be less likely to be able to get out of poverty because there's no jobs in the area where the rents are cheaper. And because you're poor, it's not like you can just, you know, buy a car and drive across the bay into the, the, the job that you had previously. So, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of problems with sending people out. And when we talk about the mistakes of the past, that's really what we tried to do with public housing. A lot of this, and I'm not saying that the person who asked the question, because I think it comes from a good place, but there's an out of sight, out of mind kind of mentality. And if we, if we want a vibrant city, um, if we want to really do things right, we want to make sure that poor and working class um, alongside middle class and upper class people can afford to live in the city so that we can, you know, you know, I mean, we're talking about um, having to commute and what that means in terms of quality of life and what that means in terms of not having walkables, you know, I mean, all of this stuff much more dramatically impacts impoverished people who don't have the, the privilege of um, money to be able to get around really easily. So I just, um, I think that that's the fundamental reason um, and, um, and also we're already doing it. It's a big mistake. So, I, you know, for us, it's just like, let's, um, let's try to make sure that everybody has a safe and decent place to live in our community. And that's, that's, that's what my priority is. Um, it's, um, to try to figure out a way to do it here in San Francisco. Yeah, it's going to be more expensive, but it's worth it. Um, if we're able to, um, if people are able to build on their community, um, if we're able to maintain a vibrant, diverse city, if we're able to really um, get us to the place that we want to be, it means that everyone needs a safe and decent place to call think, home here in the city. I, I think it's really important that that point that you made that we're, we're a tapestry with interconnected threads, right? Um, if a place is less expensive to live in, it has likely less infrastructure which means less public transportation, which means somebody has to buy a car, own a car, maintain a car, and pay for insurance on a car, right? right? It means that if you go into a low tax state, it's probable that you have very few services because low taxes means that you can't afford that many services. So all of a sudden people with needs receive no support. It means isolation. You end up with a kind of an ethnic cleansing as well because how because of how wealth is distributed. So we end up with monocultures, and and that's the systemic and racism, right? So it's, if we look at it as as a family, as we're all part of one family, we start to adjust our our attitudes. Lewis, you were the one who originally uh, sort of made that point, and I glommed onto it. This whole idea of the American family. Um, how should we treat each other if we're one one family? And Anne, um, it would be great if you could also weigh in because as you said, sometimes um, people with mental health issues, they're discarded and alienated from their family. And we, you know, we can understand how difficult that is as well. So could you both in sequence, Lewis and then Anne comment on this? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's clearly a values question, right? Uh, and we're having a values conflict in this country. Um, and I certainly come down on the side of, we all do better when we're, we see each other as part of, of one family. And uh, um, I think we're having a really deep conversation about that. I'm, I was very glad to see the stimulus package be bold and big and very helpful to people who are, are, are the poorest. It not only is real help, but it's also a message about values and what we care about. And I'll just, I'll just say this, that, so it's a value, but it's also economics. Uh, because the problem with, um, 
excluding people is it's ex extremely expensive. I forget where it was. I think I believe it was New York Times. There was an article on uh, the filling up of swimming pools in the South in order to avoid desegregating swimming pools. So the white kids lost out on the swimming pool as well as the black kids because they just right. filled them up. They didn't want to have to integrate. And it's a great metaphor for, I mean, that's very real, but it's also a metaphor for what we've done with housing and what we've done with people with special needs in this country. And it has not done anything but causes all an awful lot of pain, particularly, I mean, social pain, but also economic pain. It's very costly Husband, to try to pick someone up after they've been excluded and very costly. Um, you know, Santa Clara County did a study of the most chronic homeless people in their county. And they did a cost study and came up with a number of $85,000 for the top 5% a year. And I think, it, and they said, you know, this is probably a conservative number, $85,000 a year to do nothing, wrong. you know, just to be reactionary, put right. people in jail, put people in hospitals. And if you did, you know, the sort of, uh, model of housing that we can provide, it's around $35,000 a year uh, with wraparound services. $35,000 versus $80,000, right? Uh, $35,000 effective, $80,000 reactive. Uh, we right, just right. completed a poll in which we asked developing solutions that address chronic homelessness, which particular groups should receive the first investment. And we had 36% uh, say uh, families, and 0% um, said uh, the disabled, and 0% said uh, women in particular. So families, yes, women and disabled, no, and the rest were kind of spread fairly evenly. It's just a very interesting perspective here. And then we went, uh, uh, we went on to ask which of the following measures do you believe would be the most effective? Um, we asked people to select two. Um, in preventing homelessness. Um, and the, the one that received the most votes were, was less expensive housing. And then the second most votes uh, went to uh, improved policy and government and then uh, followed by mental health services. And we're coming to the end of our time. Could you take us out in terms of how do we deal with marginalized populations? How do we make sure that we are not relegating people who have mental health issues how do we, or, addict, or addiction issues, how do we ensure that we do not relegate our family members to lives of misery? Thank you, I appreciate that. I would say, ask yourself, and I think Jennifer said, you know, people are looking, you know, we're gonna push people out of, out of whatever community they're looking in and people need to look in their communities. Do we have the resources, the housing in my own community to support people? of all different special needs, of low incomes, of middle, of high, to making a thriving community. And San Francisco in particular was always a place for everybody. That's what San Francisco was known for. People made fun of it They've, for years. It is, and it's that's where San Francisco has to get back to a place, is everybody, every neighborhood has the right to live there in a supportive, dignified way, services matter, the type of housing matters, and the sense of community and your values matter. Um, so I think we really can do the right thing. And we have before. And some, as I said before, some of it is happening. It's just not enough. And what a great note to end on, because it really is a commentary on the country, right? It's, it's we need to be, as Americans, we need to be for the American family. Um, and the family includes everyone. It includes the, the uncle who is uh, racist. It includes the person who is disabled or blind or in, in some way has a challenge to overcome. It includes our children who might need help. It includes our elderly who might need care, right? So what kind of America are we going to have? And what kind of, of America are we going to have if we're going to see those with less as people who require investment to create the country we want. I think that's what you're all about. And I, I wanna thank you all and your staffs and your board and your contributors and your donors for, for their service. Lewis, you want to say something? Uh, I don't, I don't wanna cut you off. Let's- No, no, I-, I uh, take, us, take us out, Lewis. Yeah, I just, uh, with Anne's comment, I think we should, we, we could do better. It's not impossible. This is, uh, 
we know what works. That's the important thing to remember. It's like with COVID, you know, it's as simple as wearing a mask. It's actually, we've got to invest in housing opportunities for people with services. Great. Well, thank you all. Jennifer Friedenbach, um, Executive Director of the Coalition for Homelessness, Homelessness in San Francisco, Louis Shequin, uh, CEO of Boat Services and Ann uh, Quintance, CEO of Canard House. Thank you so much. Thank you, staff. Thank you, donors. Thank you, board members. And have a great day. That's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay safe, mask up, get your vac uh, vaccine and have a great day. <laughs>